Hello, everyone. Hello and welcome to another educational webinar from John Brooks Company Limited. My name is Anita Gupta. I'm the divisional manager for filtration team here at John Brooks Company. I will be your presenter today with two other panelists. Sav Sony, our technical sales representative for filtration division. Uh, Sav is a mechanical engineer and have been working with us for almost four years now in filtration group. Welcome, Saab. Hello, my, good morning, everyone. My other panelist is Michael Black with me, who has over 15 years of filtration experience, and he's our inside technical sales specialist for filtration division. Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning in the West Coast. I also have Nicola Floresca with me, who is our inside technical sales supervisor. He's the host of today's webinar. I guess his role today will be to ensure we do not exceed the time and stay focused. Hello, everyone. Audio and visual will be turned off for all attendees during the presentation. Uh, panelists will also turn off their videos during the presentation. And we'll come back um, after the presentation at Q&A time. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen to put any questions you may have, which we will answer after the session. This session is scheduled for 60 minutes and we will most likely finish it early. So we'll have time to answer any questions you may have. Um, after the session, a recording will be made available on YouTube and a link will be sent to all attendees. Uh, please let us know if you need a certificate of completion for your professional educational points for attending this webinar. We'll be more than happy to send that to you. Um, thank you again. Uh, let's, uh, let's get going. So uh, our today's webinar is about solid liquid separation using manual filtration. So just before we get into it, just a little bit about who we are. John Brooks Company is a privately owned company founded in 1938. We have over 200 employees across Canada and we are a full service provider of pumps, filtration equipment, spray nozzles, custom skid packaging, and we specialized in valves, compressed air purification equipment, heat exchangers, and last but not the least, uh, we have our own uh, pressure vessels manufacturing shop. Today's uh, learning objectives, what we're going to get out of this presentation is, we will learn about what is filtration. Uh, some of you might have attended our first webinars that was about fundamentals of filtration so you may remember from that and then we will focus on manual filtration system we will learn about the components of what makes a filtration system for example filter housings filter media accessories and all that uh, we will also learn about filter media performance such as particle removal efficiency filter rating, and dirt holding capacity. We will learn about filter selection, filter media configuration, uh, and then we'll get into disposable filter media and cleanable filter media and types of filter housings, bodies, canister to hold any different uh, filter media. Okay. Hi, it's uh, Mike here. Uh, just one question in regards to the filter media performance that you uh, mentioned. Um, I'm going to touch on change out or cleaning uh, frequencies. Uh, that's something I get asked a lot to know from my customers. Uh, yes, thank you, Michael. Uh, yes, we should definitely touch on that. So, in terms of filter media performance, uh, we will talk not just about the dirt holding capacity. Uh, as Michael has mentioned, we get asked all the time. Um, what is the life of the media? You know, uh, dirt holding capacity and change out frequency. Uh, most definitely, thank you, Michael, for reminding me for that. All right, first thing first, what is filtration, right? I think in simple words, if we explain, it's a process of removal of unwanted contaminants from a fluid stream by passing it through a permeable medium so basically here we're talking about size and exclusion. You have certain size of particles that we do not want on our clean side. 
and we use a filter media to remove it. And to get through this, it, you are e either using, it's a gravity feed, or we could use a vacuum pump on the other side, or it's a pressurized feed. So filtration is basically removing off unwanted contaminants from a stream. And why we call it filtration and not separation, not purification, because we're using a filtration medium. Now, since this topic is about manual filtration, so let's, why we're calling it a manual filtration? Because it's not self-cleaning filtration. It's not an automatic filtration, which will be covered in our next uh, seminars, uh, which will be in October, um, you know, last week of October. So why we call that as a manual filtration? Because this is a type of filtration system where a manual intervention is needed to change the filter media to, or to clean out the filter media, a filtration system that requires operator's intervention. For example, um, a strainers or a, a, a multi-cartridge unit or cartridge unit in a big amine plant. That's where uh, you know, the operator has to change the cartridges. Uh, y strainer. So these are examples of some manual filters. On the other hand, automatic self-cleaning filter that we will cover later uh, in our future webinars where Op regular operator intervention is not needed. The filter media cleans automatically by various ways, mechanically or backwash, and then we'll cover that in detail in future uh, webinars. Let's understand the basic components of any filtration system. Of course, there is a dirty side and there's a clean side, and in between this, there is a back box which we call a filter. What this filter is, there is a filter body, and inside the filter body, there is filter media. Filter media is the heart of a filter system. In addition to the filter body and filter media, there are other necessary, very necessary components, like gauges, inlet gauge, outlet gauge, or it could be a delta P gauge, and the isolation valves. So these gauges, uh, specifically the delta P gauge, or differential pressure gauge, this is a very, as important as having a, a gas gauge in your, in your car. Like how would you know that your car needs more gas? If, if you can't see that you know, you're running empty or you're almost at the, um, you know, at the stage where you should get the gas. So these are, I know you call the jewelry, jewelry or accessories, which are very, very essential to a filtration system. Okay, and we will learn. Uh, today we're not focusing on these filter gauges or valves, uh, but just I thought we'll mention that. Continuing with the components of filter system, manual filter system, there's a filter housing. You know, filter housing, uh, one on the left could be, this could use filter bags, or filter cartridges, or even a filter machine, something like um, filter press. That's a filter body or a strainer. So these are different type of filter machines or filter vessels or filter housings, call them. And continuing with the components of manual filter system, then the, the heart of the filter system is the filter media. And you can, you can divide them in two parts, disposable filter media and cleanable filter media. So cleanable filter media will be, for example, your metal basket. It gets dirty, take it out and clean it. That's a cleanable type of filter media. Or a stack of cleanable discs, that's a cleanable type of filter media. On the other hand, filter bags, uh, the cartridges, filter pads, uh, these um, lenticular disc or filter roll, these are all disposable type of filter media. At the bottom you see sand and carbon, they, this could be both cleanable or disposable type filter media. Now before we get deep into understand the performance of a filter system, um, let's, let's understand what sometimes we wish for and what's the reality is. So talking about what our expectations or wishes when we install the filter system. We, we are, are wish that, okay, we have installed the filter system. That's it, I'm done. This filter media will last forever. 
it's just like you know you buy a car and the, the car manufacturer they give you a full tank of gas and then you never have to put the gas again how real is that uh uh not real at all so same similarly a filter media which is the gas in your in your filter vessel it has a maximum dirt holding capacity it will need cleaning it will need a change out that's the reality so you can't have a filter vessel installed and never have to change the filter media. Another unrealistic expectations that I know I have heard a couple of times is, oh, I have installed a 50 micron filter, but on my other side, I see a lot of particles still 50 micron. The reason is the filters are not absolute rated. They do not remove 100% of every single particle in the dirty stream. That's just not possible because the most filter medias are nominal rated. But this doesn't mean that you can't have a filter media that will remove closer to 100% removal. Though that's what we'll get into. Those are called absolute rated filter media. And another expectations that we all hear all the time is that, oh, the filter system will work you know you, i bought a multi cartridge filter housings or um you know a sand filters and just gravity feed it and i have to change this filter bag every day most filter reality is most filter systems they need pressurized feed i'm not saying all of them there are some strainers there are certain type of smaller filter system that you could gravity feed them and there are certain types of filter system um, which work strictly on gravity but most filter systems that we're going to discuss today they need pressurized feed or maybe the vacuum on the other side and another expectation is uh, we get asked all the time uh, what is going to be the pressure drop i don't want any pressure drop to my filter system that's just not a reality. There will be a pressure drop. There will be a pushback. When you have something going from a big, let's say you have a six inch pipe into a hundred micron filter vessels, you know, you're going from such a large pipe size to very, very fine micron, you're going to have filter, you're going to have a pushback, you're going to get resistance, and that's going to show up on your gauges as a pressure drop. The key is, the reality is, we should opt for a filter system that gives us the minimum pressure drop and that it comes to all the science and arts of selecting the proper filter system so going to continuing to talk about the filter media performance filter media performance you define as uh, particle removal efficiency you know if it's rated for 50 micron is it removing 90 percent of those 50 micron particles 60% of what type of filter efficiency that is what type of filter rating it has how much dirt holding capacity a filter has and what will be the change out frequency and that's what we're going to talk a bit more detail continuing with the particle removal efficiency as I just mentioned in uh, two slides before um, let's say a filter is rated for 100 micron Right? Is it going to remove everything 100 micron and larger? That will be an unrealistic expectation. Most filters, especially most industrial filters, they're nominal rated. So they're going to remove anywhere between, you know, close, some filters are even rated like 30% efficient. That means they're going to remove 30% of those rated particles. Or 50 to 60% efficiency, that's what we call the nominal rated filter. But that does not mean that we cannot get a higher efficiency filters. You could get filters rated for as high as 99.999% removal. And what is the unit of measurement of that efficiency? It's called beta ratio that I'm going to show you in the next slide. Now, if you look at this chart here, the beta ratio or a beta value is the unit of measurement of particle removal efficiency. For example, if a filter is 1000 beta, that means its particle removal efficiency is 99.90. And if it's 5000, 
that means it's 99.98% removal. Does that make sense? Hi, Anita, it's Mike again. Um, yes. Just in regards to the beta value, I've had some customers asking me if a 5,000 beta is five times as efficient as a 1,000, but I don't believe that's so. Uh, can you just uh, explain that? Uh, looking at the chart and looking at all the studies, uh, definitely, it's not definitely five times better. In terms of the particle removal efficiency, a thousand beta ratio removes 99.90 and a 5,000 beta ratio 99.98. So it's a difference of out of 100,000 particles, a difference of 0 0.08%. Okay. Um, yeah, no, that's a, that's a pretty good question. That, that's, that's sometimes a misconception, and that's where I think Michael, you, and uh, Sab, and all other other salespeople who are out on the road gets into, um, you know, educating uh, different customers. Beta ratio, as we talked about, it's the unit of measurement of particle removal efficiency. It's basically a ratio of the number of particles upstreams larger than the filter rating and the number of particles downstream of that filter, filter media. That will be the filter rating. So that gives us the nominal versus absolute rated filters. And again, can the nominal rating is an arbitrary number assigned by a filter manufacturer. You know, let's say if I'm making a type of filter, Michael is making another type of filters. Michael can rate that filter 60% efficient, and I could say my filter is 90% efficient. It's, it is strictly the, the, the ratio that is assigned by the filter manufacturer. So that is very confusing. In these, it's very confusing. So what is an absolute rating filters? Absolute rating get into, it is typically, I would say 98% efficient. Some manufacturer thing, anything that's over 90% efficient is absolute rated. And these type of retentions or rating is needed when the application is very critical. For example, you know, if this is a pharmaceutical applications where it is critical, if we say that the filter is removing 0 0.02 micron, is it indeed removing 98%, 99.99%? That's where it gets into play. So it's a good question to ask from a filter manufacturer. Uh, is it a nominal rated or absolute rated? And just from the practical perspective, most applications are good for nominal rating. Because in reality, the filters, the way they work, for first few seconds, there will be a cake buildup on the filters and, and uh, uh, filters become finer over a period of time. If you start at 50 micron, by the time it gets dirty, it's actually filtering 30, 25 micron. That's called the cake building process. And we discussed that, how they work um, in, our, uh, in our previous webinars. Continuing with the uh, rating, uh, let's not forget about the microbial removal. Microbes are also particles, right? For example, some bacteria are as fine as 0 0.2 micron. Crypto and Giardias are uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.4 micron. Viruses are a lot more finer. Viruses are DNA and RNA of, um, of microorganisms. Particle removal efficiency, the unit of measurement is beta ratio. And microbial removal efficiency is measured in LRV, log reduction value. One log reduction is 90% efficient. Two log reduction is 99% removal. Three log reductions, 99.9. Four log, 99.99. So if you are looking for a filter and you want to make sure it removes all bacteria, 99.99, that means we will be asking a manufacturer that your filters needs to be rated for four log or better. There are actually some filters rated for seven log removal. And there's a formula to calculate that. And this seminar is not about, you know, to getting into the detail of the formula, but if anybody's interested, we'll be more than happy to talk about that. Continuing with the filter performance, our favorite 
topic that we all the time think about it when we buy a filter, how much solids it's going to hold. What is the dirt holding capacity? Because we know that more dirt holding capacity, higher, longer the life, you know, longer the time between the change out. And what is a dirt holding capacity? Dirt, it is the measure of a weight gain of a filter, filter media during its useful time. How do you measure it? Are you going to take the filter bag or filter cartridge or a strainer out and measure it before and after? No, that doesn't sound very practical. We measure it by pressure drop at a given rate. You know, how much pressure drop it's happening. That's, that measures your dirt holding capacity. A pressure drop is also an indication of uh, change out frequency. Now, yes, the reality is the filter is going to plug. An expectation is, and it should be, that my filter should last longer. You know, I, I, I spent so much of money in buying this filter. Uh, you know, Sav and Michael and Anita, they all came by to size a filter. They sold us this filter. It should last long time. So how do we know this A filter will last longer than the B filter? So there are a number of things we need to consider. One is what type of filter media are we using? Is it a surface type filter, depth type filters, which we will look into detail in the next few slides. Uh, what type of solids are we using? Are these solids are heavy, settleable? You know, if they're settleable in nature, they might just sit in the filter vessels may not even plug the filter media. What is the, how much solids are coming in? And another important one is the open area ratio. That plays a very important role in a good selection of filter, spe specifically when we look at the uh, strainers. Uh, just to understand what's an open area ratio here is. Uh, so for example, if we purchase um, a, a two inch strainer, basket strainer, and inside the basket has one eighth inch perforation. Okay, so there's a two inch line coming in and then the basket has thousands and thousands of holes of one eighth inch perforation, which is a good thing. It should have thousands of holes. It should not have 10 or 20 holes. If it has less holes, that means you have less open area for that fluid to go through. Less open area means your filter, your strainer basket will plug very quickly. You might have to change it multiple times a shift. So what is the, um, the ideal open area ratio? One to four. That the number of the total area of all the holes, all the open area in the basket, especially it applies to surface filters, should be at least four times the open area of the inlet and outlet. Another one is, and I am touching that the last, is flux rate. What is a flux rate? Is it flow rate? Uh, yes, it is flow rate per unit of area, per unit of filter area. Your filter would last a lot longer if the flux is lower. It's just like, you know, when, you're, when you go on a treadmill and you say that, okay, if you, if you run at, you know, three miles an hour, you'll be able to run for an hour. But if you start right at the five miles an hour, you might get tired in half an hour. So flux rate is lower the flux rate. Don't abuse the filter. Don't just start, you know, if you have a pipe size is two inch and the pump manufacturer says, oh, you can put 180 gallons per minute. That does not mean you could put 180 gallons per minute through a five micron filters. Make sure we have enough filter area to cap that. That's cover the flux rate. Continuing with the filter performance, uh, change our frequency. That's all we need to, we want to minimize that. We don't want to change our filter every hour. We don't want to change our filter every day. We want to keep this life of the filter as longer as possible. And when do we know the filter need change? Differential pressure. You need to have that gauge. We need to have that gas gauge there, just like in the car. Uh, and there are recommended change out pressure drop for cartridges, for bags and strainer, and every filter manufacturer will recommend that. Uh, for 
filter cartridges, standard filter cartridges, uh, the recommended change out is 25 to 30 PSID. Uh, for bags, uh, about 15 to 20 uh, PSID. For strainer, it is also 10 to 15 PSID pressure drop. However, the filter manufacturer will say for a strainer, whatever clean delta P you start at, once your delta P reaches twice that value, that's an ideal time to change it. So what happens if I don't do it? If you don't change that at that time? Oh, well, you know what? Your filter will plug completely. It will not work. You will not have any flow on the other side and filter might break. You may get all the solids in your clean stream. If this is a basket screen, it might burst. You might exceed the weld. Um, you might actually break the welds of the basket. So it's, it's always recommended to follow the guidelines from filter manufacturer. Let's touch a little bit on the uh, sizing of a filter, filter selection. Remember filter media is the heart of a filter body. And what dictates what type of filter media, what type of filter you're going to use? Contaminants. What you are removing, how much you are removing, what's the nature of the contaminants? That's going to dictate the filter you're using. And uh, we always um, ask uh, certain minimum design conditions to make sure the filter is selected correctly. Of course, the most important, what are we filtering? Retention means how fine we need to filter. What is the nature of contaminants? Are we filtering soluble sand type solids? Are we filtering some uh, um, deformable solids? Uh, are, is there oil in it or is there sand in it? Um, and particle size distribution. Are all the particles in the stream all of the mostly of the same size? Or the particle size distribution says that some particles are 20 microns, some are 40 microns, some are 50 microns, where the peak is. So that will help a filter manufacturer or filter engineer to select the most optimal type of filters. And it's also important to make sure we take into consideration the, the pressure coming in because that will tell us if the filter vessel will need, will need to be built to U-STEM or U-M-STEM or needs to be built to ASME Section 8, needs a CRN registration. Um, we need to understand uh, how many times uh, somebody can change the filter or clean the filter. So what's the expected cleaning frequency? So uh, anytime uh, you're asking a filter supplier or filter manufacturer, ask them if do they have an application data sheet? And I know we do, um, so we send them, or if not, if you're not sending your application data sheet, uh, you know, we should be asking these questions. Continuing with the filter selections, uh, pressure drop. Pressure drop, if you can remember, while sizing a filter, remember to size a filter in such a way that the clean pressure drop is very, very low. And also the recommended change out pressure drop, these two things we should remember. And there, the time between the clean pressure drop and the recommended change out should be as long as possible. So if, if a manufacturer is telling you that I'm going to give you a filter where the clean pressure drop is two PSID and recommended change out is 35 PSID. Let's ask them, is the recommended change out will happen in an hour or one week? You know, of course you want it one week or even a month. See, that's where all the arts and science gets in. You know, who's packing the most filter media, who's most making it most optimized type of filters. Continuing with the filter media, uh, we, can, we can divide that in three different categories, mainly actually two, surface and depth filters. So surface filter is like your, um, your patio screen. That's a soft surface filter. It's not letting any bugs get in the house. A surface filters under pressure will let some fibers go through, some deformable particles go through. On the other hand, depth media, something like a thick cartridge filters or your sand filters, they are pretty good in holding organics or deformable solids, as well as fibers. Another type of filter media is that has some charge on it, adsorptive type of filter media. Um, in that case, there are, um, you know, the particles will have 
uh, sorry, the media will have a certain charge, a certain type of charge. Uh, mostly, um, it will be positively charged, and then the contaminant negatively charged will be caught in there. Oops. Okay. Now, continuing with the surface filters. These are a few examples of the surface filters, you know, filter bags, filter baskets, okay? Filter media get one chance to capture the particles. And then on the other hand, depth filters. Most filter cartridges, there are certain pleated ones are surface filters. And within the depth filters, depending on, um, you know, the depth filter could have the uniform porosity or grading, graded porosity. Graded porosity is where um, the, the if filtration is happening from outside in, outside you could catch larger particles and it goes in the depth of the filter media, you will be able to capture finer particles. So th that's all need to be taken into account make, to make sure that the filter meets the expectations. Continuing with the cleanable and disposable filter media, you know, the filter media can be packed as a woven or non-woven filter cloth or the bonded type of filter media. Could be sand or multimedia, charge media, and we'll go a little bit more detail on that. Disposable filter media, and then we'll touch on a cleanable one. Fill all filter bags, filter cartridges, adsorptive or charge type media, media beds, and activated carbon filter. These are certain examples of disposable filter media. In the next couple slides, we'll touch on the different media material for filter bags. Most common type of disposable type of filters here. Filter bags. They are very popular, very cost-effective type of manual filters. Um, and the materials, polyester, polypropylene, mesh, that we, the nomenclature goes by PEMU or nylon. You can also get the filter bags in um, Nomex media. And just remember here we're talking about solids, liquids separation. How do we know which filter bag to use when? And it all boils down to proper filter selection. Okay? So for example, if I need a very high temperature filter media, I will be coding, will be looking at Nomex which has a rating of 425 Fahrenheit. NMO, nylon mesh, has also has a higher temperature rating. Uh, polyester is 300, polypropylene is a lot lower. Polypropylene, you will notice, is the most common type of filter bag material we use because of its just versatility. Um, it's compatible with most fluids. Then polypropylene has another ability. It's a very good oil. It has an affinity for oil. That's where we use polypropylene also for oil absorbent. So if you look at this chart here, most filter bags are nominal rated, 50 to 60 microns. However, we could also get high efficient filter bags where you, know, you will be able to remove over 90% particle removal. Then there are filter bags which have graded porosity, means it will capture the larger particles on the outside, and the finer inside will have the dual layer or multiple layers. Okay? You, we, we all, you can also ask for filter bags in addition to the particle removal, it will be able to capture oil, free oil, not emulsified oil, free oil. There are filter bags insert which are packed with oil absorbent material or the carbon material that can be used for hydrocarbon removal. To get more life out of filter bags, we could increase a lot more filter area by making the filter bags material pleated. As you could see in this picture here on the bottom left, and this is in one of the real picture from one of our customer at a mine site, they had uh, 15,000 parts per million of solids coming in at that time. So we had to optimize the pleat design in such a way that the all the dirt was captured, a lot of dirt was captured in between the pleats. The filter material, filter bag materials, you can get NSF rating, FDA compliant, 
um, the closure can be the, the plastic or metal, and there are standard size. Moving on to the cartridge filters, uh, cartridge filters are also disposable, right? They will be packed into surface filters or depth filters or in a membrane phones or lenticular. There are cleanable cartridges as well, um, which will be more metallic or plastics. So let's go into the different size of it and then we will cover what material you can get filter cartridges. So filter micron rating, with filter cartridges, you could filter really, really fine. 0.25 micron, down to 0.25 micron. And even there are some filter manufacturers which make filter cartridges even down to 0.1 micron. A standard industry sizes is two and a half inch diameter, and it comes in 10, 20, 30, or 40 inch long. There is another name called Big Blue Cartridge, which has a four inch diameter or four and a half, and the most common size is 10 inch and 20 inch. Then there are even larger diameter cartridge have come and it's just, um, they are, uh, they help when we have a higher flow and we, when we don't want to change the filter that often. Uh, the diameter is larger, uh, it could be 6.25 or could be as big as 7.5 and the length it comes in 10 inch, 40 inch or 60 inch length. Most filter cartridges, the flow direction is from outside in, but there are filter cartridges is also inside out. Nobody's going to say, tell you that, hey, why are you calling it a filter cartridge? Because it's inside out, you know? I'm okay with that if you wanna call an inside out also a filter cartridge. Um, not to go into a whole lot of detail, uh, but filter cartridge gives us the, um, the ability to pick a lot more filter media polypropylene, polyester, cellulose, cotton, nylon, polyether sulfone when you're making membranes, fiberglass, teflon, PVC material, stainless steel, glass, activated carbon. And in addition to the filter media, um, you know, we need to be careful, what is the support material? What type of cage material is in there? You know, you could have a teflon media, but then it also needs a cage around it, which might be PVC, the gasket. So all that needs to be taken into account when we're selecting a proper filter cartridge. Um, similar to uh, filter bag materials, filter cartridge medias also, you know, we need to look at it. Uh, what we are filtering, what is this chemical compatibility? What is this temperature compatibility? Um, you know, if we're filtering amine, are we going to use polypropylene? Are we going to use, um, fiberglass or cellulose, uh, why not Why not A, why not B? Uh, there's a whole lot of science behind it to make sure that at the end, the goal is to get the most performance out of a filter media. Filter media is packed, you know, surface filters or depth filters, right? Like pleated filters, something like that. That will be a surface filters metal, something like these one will be pleated filters or depth filters, like you could have melt blown type of filters, bonded, um, the, or they, they could be bonded with the same media. For example, this one, the white one here is the polypropylene bonded with polypropylene. The one here, the brown one, it has um, a glass fiber or, uh, or, or, or different material, but the bonded material is different. This is very popular in the industry where we don't want to use a polypropylene media. For example, I remember in the pulp industries, um, they, we, 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 don't, we don't like to use a polypropylene media. It's just, it will, because it's a natural process activated carbon and media with zeta potential. That's a very special type of filter media. And I think Mike has a lot of experience with that. Mike, if I could ask you to shed some light on this one. Absolutely, Anita. Um, yeah, you mentioned the, the zeta potential uh, type cartridge, one on the bottom left. Um, that's the zeta plus uh, by 3M, it's called a lenticular style cartridge. Uh, I like it because it's uh, commonly used in my favorite industry, which is beer and wine making. <laughs> Don't forget uh, pharmaceutical. <laughs> yeah, but beer and wine, you know, that's top on my list. <laughs> um, again, this is uh, what's called a hybrid filter media because it uses both depth filtration 
and electrokinetic adsorption that we talked about earlier. And again, uh, adsorption it removes the negatively charged particles by absorbing them to the positively charged surfaces of the filter. Uh, because of this, uh, it removes uh, like a wide range of uh, contaminants. It's not really a uh, defined pore size. So it actually, uh, you know, just depending on what you'd want to remove, it will do it in a, in a range. Um, again, with the beer and wine industry, it's excellent for clarifying the, um, the liquids uh, by removing yeast or bacteria haze. And again, in pharma or bioscience, these are great for blood fractionation and lipid removal. Oh, thank you. So Michael, is it, is it correct to say that they don't have a defined micron rate? That's correct. It's a range. Yes. Okay, okay. Yes. Thank you. Oh, that's good. Um, so this, uh, this one, here we summarize surface filter versus depth filters, and we will share these slides with you so you don't really need to write it down. Uh, before we end the filter cartridge one, uh, filter cartridge as mentioned is very versatile. Um, we get diff so many different type of filter medias. You could go as fine as 0.25 micron. Uh, most common ones are double open end, open from both sides. So if it's a coarse filtration, I would recommend you could stay with double open end. But if we're filtering very, very fine filtration, 0.25 micron, you know, we might want to stay with the single open end. And the one end could be a flat cap or it could be the spear or fin, might have an O-ring. Um, and the gaskets or O-ring could be different material depending on the chemical compatibility and thermal compatibility that we're looking for. Um, before we get to the filter housings, uh, cleanable filter media. Uh, cleanable filter media, as this indicates, is there the, um, the, the, the perforated media, has the punch hole, perfs, uh, and the mesh, you know. We, we can talk for hours and hours of, about why we shouldn't go into a very, very fine mesh, because going with the 50 micron mesh, metal mesh versus 50 micron bag, gives you a total different performance. It's all about the open area ratio. The bags gives you a lot more life versus, but again, that's a consumable item, right? So depending on what you're looking for, you might have to stay with screen. Um, then we could have a pleated um, sintered metal or, 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 or depth type. Could have a Dutch weave type of filter media, a slotted wedge wire media, or the, the, the plastic media. Actually, I would ask uh, Sav to, uh, share a recent uh, experience he had with uh, the performance of mesh and perf versus a slotted media. Yeah, Nira. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, not too long ago, I visited this customer. In, it was in pulp and paper industry. I got a call one day, uh, you know, customer was complaining that they have to change the mesh basket quite often. Now, again, this was an existing application um, customer had bought the screen a year ago from different supplier. We were not aware of this application. So I get a call and he's like, can you come down and, you know, recommend us something that we don't have to change quite often. So I, I was curious. So while walking down to the plant, I, I asked him, so what kind of fluid is this? What, what, what do you have in the fluid? Why is it getting plugged so fast? And, you know, customer was saying, uh, this is white water. We're seeing a lot of fibers in, in it. And I was like, uh huh, okay. And what's, what kind of screen you have in, in the housing just while walking to the plant? And he was like, oh, we have mesh screen. So I immediately knew something, something is wrong. So as soon as we opened the housing, we opened the screen, it was mesh screen and all these fibers were stapled around, around the basket and it was plugging fast. So it, it, it tells us that mesh screen does not work well with fibrous material because it, fibers will staple around all those baskets. So at that time we recommended, let's go with slotted wedge wire because that's what industry recommends, that's what John Brooks recommends. And we changed it and the clean out frequency was improved from every shift to two weeks. And you know he was very happy with slotted wedge wire uh, screen versus mesh. So it's very important. A few slides ago, you mentioned that uh, nature of contaminants 
dictates the met method of removal. So it's very important to know the application process conditions. And that's what we really do at John Brooks and recommend the right product to our customer. Thank you. Well, you could say Sav is a salesperson. <laughs> Thank you, Sav. Uh, I mean, I, I think that's, that's the difference between talking to a filter supplier versus a filtration specialist. Uh, I mean, um, it's always a great idea to cover all that. Make sure we understand what the, what the requirement is. Okay. Um, before we end about filter media, uh, we will not go into a detail of that because this is a very wide topic. But since we talked about the sand media and carbon media at one point, I mean, depending on what we're removing, for example, if the goal is to remove chlorine, you know, we might use activated carbon granular activated carbon. You know, if we're removing sediment, you know, might be using sand filters. If it's arsenic or fluoride removal, activated alumina. Uh, I'm just showing it to you just that, you know, there are options out there. Most of these type of medias are, filters are self-cleaning automatic filters, but however, you could also get a manual filter like that. Now we can't end this before talking about, we've been talking about filter media. Uh, let's talk about the filter media needs a body. You know, let's make all those mechanical engineers happy as well, not just the chemical engineer. So strainers and simplex, uh, sorry, the strainers could be a vice strainer, uh, a simplex strainer where there is a single basket. However, um, there are strainers out there where in one body, you could put multiple strainer baskets in there. And we actually, this was one of our design because uh, we had a customer out in Saskatchewan at a mine site and they needed to have, they needed to reduce the clean out frequency. So this type of design was built for them. We could also have a duplex, you know, where you switch one when ones get dirty, it gives you the time to. And then the bag housing, single bags housing or multi-bag housing. You know, and all, all it boils down to you know, how much uh, dirt is coming in and how often you need to change. Same for the cartridge housing, single cartridge housings or multi cartridge housing. You could have this, uh, we, we, have, we have an installation um, for on any line where each unit takes 29 cartridges. You could have double open end cartridges like that. Each cartridge vessels need some hold down assembly. So these are some certain examples of multi-cartridge housings. Where are you going to put that activated carbon media and sand media into? The large, large media vessels. So uh, that that that's, was the last slide and that covers our, uh, this is our end of our webinar. Uh, before I end it, I'd um, like to just remind that you can sign up for our future webinars. These three are the future webinars for our, um, uh, from our filtration divisions, one coming on 20th and on 29th, and then on November 5th. And there is a link to, you could go on that, that will take you to John Brooks website, and you can look at our other webinars as well. We conduct, there are, there are educational webinars from our pump group also. So I think we will open uh, Q and A now. Nico, are there any questions? Yeah, we actually have a few uh, questions, um, and we can turn on our video now, <laughs> just so everyone can take okay. a gander at us again. So the first question that came in is, uh, it's actually quite common. Um, I find is how often is the beta uh, ratio used in industry? Uh, beta ratio, as it's the measurement, it's the, it's the unit of measurement of filter particle removal efficiency. Uh, if, if you are talking in hydraulic oil filtration and pharmaceutical industries, it's often used, quite often. But again, I would like to insist that we should ask about the particle removal efficiency in terms of percentage. 99.99 or 99.998. So depending on the industry, it is used quite often. Uh, and this, this was kind of glazed over uh, in one of your slides, Anita, but uh, uh, briefly, how is the beta ratio arrived at? Um, and uh, we can jump to the previous slide if, if you oh, want. Oh, how's the beta ratio arrived at? It is done by the manufacturer. 
<laughs> the process is actually, uh, believe it or not, it's something called, most manufacturers call Arizona dust. Uh, there is a whole, whole process around it. So a filter is subjected to filtering this dust, which it has a very defined particle size, almost like a very fine glass bead. So how realistic that is? Not really. And some filter manufacturer, they define the particle removal or beta ratio in a first pass, or some define it as a multiple pass, right? Now, this webinar is not about talking about how one manufacturer does versus, but if anybody's interested in knowing that, I'll be more than happy to talk to you about it. Right. But in pharmaceutical industry, I would say it's more important to ask, when you say your filter is rated beta 1000 for 0.25 micron, is it done in the first pass or is it after research flow? Yeah, and to add to that, Anita, because you mentioned this in uh, one of your slides, is that you do have a quick cake formation and the filter will perform finer uh, eventually. Um, and that just adds to the fact that uh, the beta ratio should be taken with a grain of salt in, in most cases. Correct, yes. Um, okay, thank you, Anita. Uh, ideal pressure drop across a filter. So what, what is the typical pressure drop that we would normally see? Uh, I'm, I'm assuming, uh, you know, this is going to be clean and dirty pressure drop is what, what you're asking. Right. So clean pressure, as I say, good filter engineer should size a filter system for less than two PSI pressure drop. And what will be a dirty pressure drop or say recommended change of pressure drop um, for the manual filtration? I haven't seen more than 35. If you're exceeding more than 35 PSID, you're compromising the integrity of the filter media. Right. Ideally, it should be kept lower than that. Okay, thank you. Um, and now th this is, again, back to the beta ratio. Um, the question whether five, beta 5,000 is five times better than, than 1,000. Um, looking at the remaining contamination, uh, 5,000 has one-fifth the remaining contamination of 1,000. Um, I guess we just want to expand upon kind of the, the difference between the two. Oh, right. So we can go back to that, that slide or maybe, you know, we'll, we'll talk to this person on the side. Uh, yeah. Yes, if you look at the how many contaminants are remaining, but that we're taking the ratio of, we're subjecting the filter to 100,000 particles. So if it's a 1,000, your remaining particles are 100. And out of 100,000, your remaining is 25. So from that perspective, but if you look at the, yes, the number of remaining particles, then it has the five times more remaining particles. But in removal of the particle removal efficiency, it's not five times more. Right, right, right. Thank you, Anita. Okay. Uh, a question that came in as well is, uh, I don't know my TSS yet, or total suspended solids, uh, but I need to begin filtering 130 micron immediately in domestic hot water. Uh, can, can you help me to get going without knowing the particle uh, total suspended solids? Uh, I would like to say yes, that's where I think the experience comes. And, and I, I think in one of the slides, I have mentioned filtration is a lot more science as well as art. Uh, Sometimes we look at it and then you could, because they say the nature of contaminants also dictate a lot. It's not just about the TSS. You know, if you shake it and a lot of particles settle down, we know that they're probably, if we optimize the flux rate, go very slow, these heavier solids are probably not even going to plug your filter media. So I would say, uh, you know, we need to talk a little bit more about that. Um, yes, it is doable if you need to filter right away. Thank you. Okay, and this is a really, really good question, actually. Does the viscosity of the liquid uh, affect the pressure drop through the filter? Very good question. And I, some, this, this person must be a very knowledgeable filter person. <laughs> uh, yes, most definitely. And I think we missed that on our, uh, the, the basic questions to ask. 
uh, this, this is pretty this is pretty advanced actually yes pretty so viscosity will affect your clean delta p as well as your change out frequency delta p so if you're sizing a filter for uh, water let's say and you need only three bags if it's water uh, and your clean delta p is two psi but if you're filtering a paint for the same flow rate you might need 18 bags depending on the viscosity of definitely does affect. Awesome. Okay, uh, how about filtration of organics uh, from surface water uh, for a small footprint? Mm, that's a loaded question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I, I, I think some more questions may be warranted to kind of uh, yeah. hone organic in on this. Organic is, um, organic is a very common word we use to describe a lot of things. Uh, when we talk about the surface water, we talk about the TOC, total organic carbon, DOC, dissolved organic carbon, organic contaminants, or are we talking about pathogens? Um, so yes, filtration can remove some of it if the organics are caused by suspended solids. But most of the time, the organics is dissolved organics. Those dissolved organics can be converted into suspended particles by doing some pretreatments like enhanced coagulation or flocculation. Now your organics are converted into suspended solids that can be filtered. So um, for small footprint, now depending on what organic that is, you could use, you can remove organics using carbon filters. You know, carbon will adsorb that organic smell, the color. So I don't know if that answered because the person is saying for small footprint, um, a carbon bed or even a carbon cartridge. Yeah. Uh, and kind of before uh, another question, I guess, I guess that was added on top of this one was just before change out is required. Um, so that that's kind of another, I guess, another loaded question that would warrant some more analysis um, because uh, depending on the water quality uh, that that's going to dictate uh, what solution would be ideal and the change of frequency right yeah that's uh, it takes a lot of practice just similarly you know sometimes some application they calls for if it's a new application a pilot a test you know if i would i would highly recommend to anyone if you can afford to ask your filter manufacturer, uh, can you provide some sample filter bags, filter cartridge or something, test it. Because the, the, how the filter media is packed. Do you remember the one slide that I showed that was pleated cartridge and believe it or not, we actually reduced the filter area, just optimize the pleats in a, such a way that there was spacing done in a way that a lot of dirt was captured in between the pleats. So if we can afford, and then I would say speak with somebody with more experience, not like go on the Google or Amazon and look for filter cartridges. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, thank you, Anita. And another question that uh, it, it ties actually into the, the surface and depth filtration that was discussed. Uh, but for surface filtration, the question is such that um, Surface filtration can be a pseudo depth filter. Um, can you please elaborate? Uh, correct, yes. So surface filters, um, depending on how the filtration is happening. Um, actually, uh, in our next seminar, we will talk about how the cake is built and how the cake is removed. It's basically a screen or a piece of cloth, and then slowly the dirt start depositing on it. It builds a filter cake. So it starts as a surface filter, but then it acts like a depth filter because those, um, that those smaller part, those larger particles which are caught on the surface of the filter media now acting as a surface media. Does that explain? Yep, yep, yep. Uh, okay, I, we're at two now. Uh, we have a few remaining questions. Um, 
just in, in out of respect of people's time, we'll answer them after the fact in the follow-up email with a video. Um, but uh, Anita, I'll, I'll let you do the closing statements with the rest, uh, uh, with Michael and Seth. Um, can I want to say thank you very much and thank you, Michael. Thank you, Sab. Um, it was it was it was great to you know have you guys as as the panelist. Uh, and thank you very much, Nico. And we look forward to having everybody for our future webinars. And please uh, reach out to Nico or myself or anybody directly if you need the certificate of completion. Thank you, and have a great uh, rest of the day, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank see you. you. We'll, we'll see you soon.